Well, welcome everybody to the Altered Attitudes podcast, brought to you by East Coast Recovery, an online addiction treatment centre based in the east of England. This episode is sponsored by Rehabs UK, the definitive place to go to find rehabilitation treatment service and advice. Today we're joined by a special guest, therapist Sam Romson. Hi Sam, thanks for joining Hi, us. Sam. Hi, hello. So you're here to help us navigate the fascinating and highly addictive world of, of chemsex, which I have to say is something I know very little about, and I know Lester's an expert in addiction, but the, the chem, chemsex is a, a really almost a kettle of fish in its own, a kind of a dual addiction that combines both sex and drugs, which is a fascinating thing to unpack. So S- Sam, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and like how you got so can interested just, can in the world of chemsex? I just say something before we get in, into that? I mean, it's just the reason for, for us um, yeah. sort of seeking out Sam and getting on the podcast was because, uh, you know, we've been quite aware of chemsex for quite a few years, um, but since we've been getting more phone calls and, and people wanting referring, we did find that it was very difficult to find places to signpost people to. So that's where we come across Sam. So we thought it was a great opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about it. And hopefully the goal of the podcast is for people to understand it a bit better, but also know where to go and get help if they feel that this is a, a problem for them and or a family member, because we get family members calling us with um, loved ones having this issue and uh, always find it's just very difficult where to sign post them to. So, uh, mm-hmm. so, yeah. so Sam, we'll if you make could sure give us a bit of your background, uh, how you come to this point would be a, a great starting place, I think. Great. Uh, I mean, actually, just to second that, Lester, that is really problem 101 in working with chemsex clients is where is the help and where are the people that that understand so we'll have a talk about this sure so it's yeah nice to see you both again um i i I work as an addiction therapist in bristol and london and and with people online and i kind of came into working with chemsex as a result of where i trained i was really fortunate i trained in in a rehab in the south coast which is a residential treatment centre that has a specialist chemsex addiction programme. I didn't know about this programme when I went to work there. I was sort of guided to work there by the people who led the degree course I was on. And as I was part of that programme and got to know the realities of, of this world, I realised actually my own addiction journey kind of took me on the fringes of this world towards the end of my using in the last year of my, my, my drug use. And so I really kind of started to become interested because the way I kind of describe it to those I work with and to people I meet is I dodged a bullet. I came in contact with chemsex, what it was about, was around the fringes, uh, very dipped my toe in, realised how dangerous my life was getting and, and got sober and, and I consider myself one of the lucky ones. I, um, so let, first and foremost I think it's important to define it because those listening who know about chemsex will know what it is but the vast majority of people don't. It does tend to fly under the radar in addiction treatment and also in in the community as well. Um, chemsex is defined as the use of certain substances to prolong, elongate and heighten the sexual experience, typically in the gay community and men that have sex with men, but it shows up in swinging communities as well. There's some prevalence in, in the research to show that. Chems is a colloquial term, a, a, a um, slang term used to describe certain drugs as crystal methamphetamine, uh, GHB, GBL, ketamine comes in there as well. And these are, when people talk about, I use chems, these are the drugs they're really referring to. Because these are, um, are uppers, they're types of uppers, and they reduce inhibitions. Um, people often describe them as feeling a sense of power when they take them. And chem sex is the combination of these drugs and sexual experience. It, Chemsex parties can involve multiple partners. Uh, one person with several sexual partners in one day can go to several different events, locations in one day, um, all with the goal of using drugs and sex together and these kind of typical chems. And so I found myself working with this. When I was at the university, I decided I was at the only rehab I knew about at the time that treated it specifically. They had a specific chem sex addiction treatment group and LBGT treatment group, but also with the rest of the recovery community as well. 
I kind of thought, well, I have to write a dissertation as part of my degree, so why don't I do it on this? So I researched client experiences in uh, treatment and recovery, specifically of chemsex clients. So I conducted some research where I interviewed um, four men about their experience of accessing treatment, what it was like being in a chemsex specific treatment program and their subsequent recovery afterwards, what it was like being in recovery after being in that program. And one thing that I know I've really learned more, which I had learned over the years I've been at this rehab working, was how little is understood about what actually goes on for these men in their addiction when they're looking for help. One participant of the research said that he was going to drug and alcohol services and people weren't believing him. They weren't believing him about what he was telling them that was happening. In chemsex, there's a lot of sexual assault. In fact, I was reading a paper this morning just to kind of refresh myself of some of the numbers. A study was done in Germany last year that found that actually 47%, nearly half of people that engage in chemsex, say that they have had their sexual boundaries violated at some stage, whether this was non-consensual sex, sexual assault, rapes. So that's really high. That's really, really high. And so it's really the sort of harms that show up with this community is there's a lot of sexual assault, there's a lot of uh, rape, there's a lot of non-consensual sexual activities. Uh, GHB is also known as the date rape drug. So we kind of know, those of us that move in addiction circles, the risks associated with this. Somebody loses the ability to control what happens, to, to act, to move. And so there's a lot of things that go on when somebody's under the influence of this that is non-consensual. And the, what I also noticed and what I've come to know is a lot of people that are in the chemsex scene, they don't necessarily correlate, understand, or at least come to terms with the danger they're in. So when they're behaving in non-consensual activities, they see this as the norm. Well, it's normal, I just went under, which is the term for overdosing on G, GHB. I went under and I woke up and yeah, that's just what happens. And so they're going through these extremely traumatic, high-risk events day in, day out, and seeing it as normal. And so that kind of really ignited something in me, that there's a community of men here that, that need support. Um, I could talk about it forever, the kind of suicide rates, rates of psychosis. It's a really high risk, at risk community. Sorry, Sam, I'm just trying to understand that, 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 that bit, that they, they think it's normal because it's just part of what they believe the seed is. It's not uh, because that's just one of the things that happens. It's just sort of accepted that that when you're in that environment doing that, that's what happens. So that, so that, that is that what they mean? They consider that normal. Yes, yes, and you know there may be some people listening to this that experience that and know that there is a there isn't a norm in it, but it's it's glossed over. Is probably the best way to describe it. It's glossed over. It's accepted as part of what goes on because of what people are seeking when they're in these kind of chemsex engagements, chemsex parties, sexual encounters. Yeah. yeah. I'd be curious to know how, it's, how it starts. You know, what, what does the begin, beginning of that look like? Is it kind of related to like a drinking culture or club culture? How, uh, yes. How, how do you get into those circles in the first place? Um, apps, mostly. So mostly it's related actually to these uh, like geographical location apps there's an app in the gay community called grinder there's others uh which uh gruff scruff sorry um it's i'm losing my i can't remember what it's called now <laughs> scruff and hornet it's, it's, it's very so social media circles that yeah people social media circles in order my to find brain's each other. having my brain's having a bit of a brain fart in terms of the exact names <laughs> but essentially the grinder is the really well-known one hornet scruff mm -hmm. there are these apps that you can go on and there are people on there selling drugs. There are people on there saying, you know, we're having a party. So that's a lot of how people come in contact with them. They're seeking sexual encounters and they come in contact with other people using chems. And that's a lot of how they become introduced to this kind of thing. Some people are the find it in the club scene. 
Yeah, there's a lot of uh, questions. I'm trying not, try not to interrupt. I'm trying not to interrupt you because <laughs> it just seems a lot of Go questions on. come up in your mind. But so we don't want to linger out too, too long. I'm sort of waiting to you to sort of explain it and then maybe go back a bit. But um, the parties are they? Who would host the parties? Is that like a paid thing or is it? Is it some sort of uh, criminal element to that to supply drugs and uh, you know what? Just about the parties that you said is quite. It can be quite a few in a day, I guess, in an area or do people no. travel? Uh, no, it's not so much about criminality or supplying of drugs or selling of drugs. It's about normally people wanting to come together for some kind of connection, normally through sex. So, it's people who don't know the campsites well would imagine it maybe as an orgy, as, as this kind of environment. So, you would go on. They would you would find people saying two men for more, three men for more. Um, these kind of tags on these apps, you would see people saying, the people that are selling drugs on the apps, you can't write drugs, chemsex, crystal meth. So they might say uh, T and G. T is the slang term, is Tina for, for drug use. So when you know people are working with people in, in, in drug addiction and they're using terms like I'm using Tina, this refers to crystal meth. So they, yeah. they will put on their profile, you know, an indication that this is what they're looking to do. And they will connect two for more, three for more. And that's how it kind of comes about. You see it a lot in saunas, nightclubs. People will connect in these kind of areas and then go home together afterwards. You can find access but that, to it that, on But that would be a different, other online that would be forums. a different thing from sort of your normal day in apps this is a, this would be sort of it's not something you could accidentally find yourself in it's something that's quite the extreme end of that of just like a normal dating app where people would want to meet um, have sort of gatherings and get together and hook up this is a this is a completely separate sort of entity that people definitely know this is what you yes and no so there's there's a bit of a uh, a culture within the gay scene of, you know, grinder, and these kind of apps are used to connect sexually for sexual hookups. People do use them in terms of dating. People do use them to find partners, as if you would imagine things like Tinder and and Bumble and these kind of things. Yes. But there is a very much a a sexual hookup undertone for these kind of apps, mm. and this is where chemsex really thrives is in these kind of environments. There's other specific websites for sexual hookups online that gay men use. In the pandemic, it became quite mm. prevalent on, you know, when people couldn't connect and meet, there were Zoom rooms set up for men at home to masturbate together online and use chems together through a kind of online chat format. Uh, and this is kind of how that we see this showing up in that kind of context. How people might come across it Somebody that, say, has never come across chems before may meet up with someone for sex on one of these apps. And that person may be a user of chems drugs, crystal meth. And so we hear a lot of stories where people say, you know, they actually suggested that I tried it because it really does make sex better. So I gave it a go. And then it does make sex better. You know, most people do this stuff to begin with because it's fun, because it's enjoyable. It's not dark mm. and shameful at the beginning. It's enjoyable. It, it so creates it could start a connection. Off, it could start you. off just meeting somebody, just like just um, wanting to meet somebody. Uh, you might go and meet the the person, not in the party environment, but just just as a one on one kind of thing. And then they may say, um, "If you tried this drug, that you might try it." And that, like, like. Uh, Matt's, Matt's saying there that may be a bit of an introduction for people that, that, yes. that could be like yes, a gateway to you know. but it, so they, they might just be going for the sex but then the drug would get introduced to them which would heighten the experience and then yes. that could be the beginning and it's of, a case it of for, for someone there are many different kinds of introductions it's hard to define exactly how somebody would get introduced because I've heard so many different kinds you know I've heard them where somebody has been who was in their early 20s was having sex with older men and because they wanted to have sex with these men and they were using G 
they saw it as, oh, this is exciting. This is me being with men in their 40s, 50s, and this is part of that world. I know I've heard stories of people going to, you know, sex with people, and they would be in, uh, in a BDSM kind of thing where they're tied and bonded, and then somebody would say, I'm going to inject you now, and they would inject them with crystal meth. And so they kind of lose that ability to say yes or no, and they go along with it, even though within themselves they knew they didn't want to. I'm, I'm, ne I'm never surprised in some of how many different ways into chemsex I hear. There's so many different ways into it. Um, yeah. And it, in the beginning, it is about coming together, connection, seeking common purpose, seeking a level of excitement that maybe normal sex or sober sex, what we call, hasn't offered. Or they find that they can only really truly be themselves. So for example, I'll share my own story. So I've met, not many of my family know this. If they do end up listening to this podcast, this is, it's, it's okay. So I ended up in the chemsex scene because I did not understand my own sexuality. I'm bisexual. And I didn't understand my own sexuality. And so I started to secretly meet up with men through Grindr. And then in that, I came in touch with someone said to me, hey, I'm getting some crystal meth. Do you want to use it? I already used drugs. I'd never tried crystal meth. So my idea was, yeah, I'll give it a go. And then I discovered what crystal meth and sex is. And so I spent a year purposefully seeking out sex and drugs at the same time and using crystal meth to heighten and elongate the sexual experience. And my introduction to it was simply a case of, yeah, I've used other drugs. I'll give it a go. You know, I knew that crystal meth was higher risk, but I didn't necessarily see it as that big a deal at the time. And so that's a very gentle introduction to it. And some people hmm. come from it having never used drugs before. And Sam, again, what's always in my mind as we're talking at the minute is because, again, I think most of the conversations that I've had, which probably just sort of four or five conversations has been with family members where you know they really see their loved one really change at a certain point would would you say that so you 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 was you would do you were already sort of doing drugs i guess um and then then you started uh on, on them kind of chemicals would that have been a massive noticeable change in your life at that point for you other than just the uh, what was he, he was actually doing? My own personal story is I was in Southeast Asia and Australia at the time, so I was quite far away um, from family. So I was already very distant, and and most most of my family didn't know about the what was going on in the end. Actually, so I couldn't necessarily offer my own story in that context. But one thing that that I would say specific to this community is the difficulty of, of being a gay man comes with a lot of its own interpersonal difficulties between family. Coming out to family can be a difficult thing, right? And some families accept it, some mm. don't. You know, so some people out there that, that are really don't, don't care, which is how it should be. And some families find it challenging and that's okay in terms of it's their story. So a lot of the family connections, bonds with these men actually has been damaged already has been impacted there's not so much trust there a lot of the, the love is on condition so they come out as being gay and they'll say that's fine we accept you but you know your grandma won't understand so maybe we shouldn't tell her or but you know people at church might not get it so we're not going to tell them right and so love becomes conditional and so family noticing a shift and a change as someone drug use gets worse in terms of chem sex maybe there's already conflict in the family it may be that there's already upset and hurt in the family and so really seeing it in the same context as somebody not of that community i believe has a slightly different aspect the kind of families you talk about they see someone's drug use get worse they start to see a real shift in behavior and yes while people Ooh. could would see that with their gay son or gay brother they may have seen a distancing in behaviour anyway because that person doesn't feel accepted within their family unit as a result of their sexuality 
When they engage in chemsex, they're immediately accepted. It's unconditional. It's actually often what they've yeah. been looking for. So actually sometimes mm. they may seem happier. They may seem more themselves in the very early days. Because, because they you become have started a, because to you get be, into feel like you become a part that. you become a part of something instead of feeling apart from you yes. sort of feel a part of which I think is quite common in lots of different levels of addiction. There's an acceptance there, isn't Yes, it? I think so. I think so. And it's it's hard because I think the one thing I'd like to say about chemsex, which kind of moves away from your questions, is a lot of the challenge with this client group is when they seek support from drug and alcohol services, people see, okay, this person has drug addiction and they have sex addiction, right? There are two things. The difficulty is they are not separate in this context. The use of drugs is so entwined with the sexual behavior that it is its own thing. We need to start seeing it as its own separate cultural thing within drug addiction. And so what people find when they come to drug and alcohol services, when they look for help in the family, when they look for support, people see it as, okay, they have a sex addiction, so we'll send them to go see a sex addiction therapist. They have a drug addiction, so we'll send them to treatment for that drug addiction. The difficulty is a lot of these people are falling through the gaps because we don't have a society that understands chemsex as its own standalone thing. And so if you go to a family and you say, to come back to your question, you know, I have a drug addiction, families kind of have an idea of what to do with that. Yes, we've worked with many families that don't know what to do, but people know that AA exists, Narcotics Anonymous exists. People know that there is rehabs out there for treatment for drug addiction. People know that sex addiction is kind of a thing. It's in the media. We see celebrities that say they've had it and things. But chemsex itself is very, very hidden. And so this is really my hope of being here. And, and this thing is to say we need to start recognising this as its own individual identity and its own individual experience. It isn't sex addiction and drug addiction as two co-occurring things. It is chemsex addiction. The addiction is to the use of sex and drugs at the same time and what that offers. So you wouldn't sort of say it was like a dual diagnosis then, it'd be the one thing? No, dual diagnosis would be chemsex alongside some kind of mental health diagnosis, depression, anxiety, psychosis, CP CPTSD. That's dual diagnosis because it's the co-occurring of an addiction and mental health diagnosis. Two addictions yeah. alongside each other. Sex addiction. Oh, you're saying it's two, it's always, it's two, addic two addictions. Yeah. So I'm just trying to get your head around it. I'm, I'm saying you're that saying chemsex, two addictions, is, but the same. Saying chemsex is one addiction. No. I'm saying yes. that two addictions alongside <laughs> each other. Chem drug addiction and yeah. sex addiction is dual, right? I'm saying that yes. chemsex addiction is its own addiction. I'm saying that chemsex right. addiction itself is not two addictions alongside each other, it is the enmeshment of drugs and sex as its own standalone addiction. In treating this, we start yeah. to separate the two, but we have to start seeing it as its own addiction. Do you get people in these communities who don't take drugs and they're just there for the sex? Does, does that ever happen or is that, is that a real anomaly? So yeah, I have actually seen this once before. Somebody that was involved in the chemsex environment and was there for the sex, sex addiction, and they didn't use the drugs alongside, they drank alcohol. And this was really interesting because I did see this, it's the first time I came across it, and we realized that this person had an alcohol addiction and a sex addiction alongside. They didn't actually have chemsex addiction. So it was, it was, it's, there is anomalies, there is exceptions to the rule that people are involved in this community mm. that don't necessarily use chems and sex at the same time. But they were a gay man that wasn't accepted in their community and they found in these sex and drug combination environments that they were accepted and that's why they went there. They found that they could be accepted mm -hmm. for the sexual preferences they had in this environment. Sorry, um, so it's just interesting just and it springs, reinforces the idea of that being. But it springs to my mind that 
it just seems like there's a there's a stage before that where you've obviously got um, the gay community that don't engage in the the, the 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 chemicals but still have the sex do then people also not feel accepted in in that group of people are you talking about those that use chemsex that engage no, in chemsex no I'm thinking that you, you, no, cause you, within the what, group of people that don't use hearing, was, yeah that they that they feel accepted and at home with the people using the chemicals uh, the chemsex ex experience if that's the way I put it but there's a whole section before that of gay people that are that are meeting having sex probably doing you know much of the same but without the chemicals do then people not feel accepted and satisfied in that group so it's a really good question chemsex would be kind of well defined as a subculture of the gay scene or men that have sex with men and there is a stigma within that scene towards those that use chems itself so what we find often is people that engage in sexual promiscuity in the gay scene right they find that once they start to use chems to prolong there can be negative judgment towards them within their own community within their own community mm. as addicts, as drug addicts, right? And so they, we find that, and what I see in my work, is that actually there is a lot of discrimination in the gay community itself towards those that engage in chemsex. So it can be quite an isolating experience in its own community. So yes, there are people within the gay scene that use drugs and have sex. Right? and might use ecstasy, cocaine, and have sex. And these drugs show up in chemsex environments as well, don't get me wrong. Chem specifically <clears throat> talks about three or four kinds of drugs, methamphetamine, G, ketamine, these kind of things. There are lots of other use of drugs in these environments, alcohol. And there is a, a kind of crossover of these two worlds. What we find is that once people start to not be able to necessarily enjoy sex, feel aroused, horny, without the use of chems, and they go doing that most, like all of the time, in order to connect, they tend to be a little bit stigmatised, segmented, judged within that community themselves. And so it's, there is a crossover, definitely, while it's fun and exciting, and there tends to be this further down the line, the kind of darker side of chemsex, where really it's mm. only about the chems. And a lot of the time people stop having so much sex. They find they're using chems on their own, at home, watching porn. They can't become aroused without the use of a drug. They find that the shame associated with that isolates them from going and having sex with people who are not using these drugs. So there is a crossover, definitely. It takes place. We call this kind of the, the golden zone, one client called it once, where it was all kind of exciting. There was some use of chems and some not, and he was still going out and having sex at parties where there was no chems. But eventually, like any addiction, there comes a crossover line where we are unable to maybe step back over, where the desire to use, the, the overwhelming craving that continues the 12 step calls it the phenomenon that craving is unquenchable that they can't really come back over to that side of of more safe promiscuity yeah i don't think that's the same with drugs and with sex isn't it that it's you kind of get used to it and it becomes more and more extreme and again i think we talked about it last time that hedonic set point goes higher and higher so to get the relief you've got to become a little bit more extreme and then it's kind of pushing you like mm. if your regular folk were sort of satisfied at this point you're going to need to reach this point and it sort of sets higher and higher and and, and then it reaches a, a sort of a ceiling and I, I remember that photograph that you showed us of them three guys on the couch uh, in, when I was thinking about that it also what come into my mind and you can correct me if I'm wrong that, that them guys are at that top end where 
you know, like with all drugs, they're like they're just not even being satisfied. It's just almost just trying to feel normal now that the the high's gone completely out of it, and now they're stuck in this extreme place, and they're not even getting any relief anymore. Exactly, and this actually is a really lovely segue, I think, to say that this is an area that anyone, if we have the ability to empathise, which my hope is most of us that work in this field do, can understand this, is there comes a point where what was this kind of prolonged, heightened connection, love, unconditional acceptance, sexual experience, turns into three men sat on a couch using, scrolling through their phones, not even feeling high anymore. And that image comes from this organisation, we'll talk about what's out there to help a bit later, but called Controlling Chemsex in London. And they're, they're, they have this graphic of three men sat on a couch, scrolling through their phones, sex and drug use paraphernalia around, you know, dildos, needles, things like this. And they're scrolling through their phones and they're all in their underwear and, and, and it just says at the top, do you recognise this scene? The reality is, is Chemsex actually turns into this extremely isolating experience where there is much less sex and much more the use of drugs without sex. And the other thing is the mental health prevalence in this kind of, so this is somewhere else that we can all empathise, is the mental health prevalence, the amount of people with you know, mental health difficulties, depression, anxiety, psychosis shows up a lot in this area is really really high so this is where we can start to ex understand the realities of what this is like like other addictions it gets to a point where it stops working where the person is completely isolated where they don't necessarily see a way out but they cannot mm. stop and that's yeah. like I heard this saying in my early recovery which I think applies to this situation where it said this, it said that alcohol gave me the wings to fly, but then it took away the sky. I like that. And I think, yeah, it gives you everything that you're kind of looking for and more for a, for a short period, but then it, you end up with nothing. But then you, you're far, far away from everybody else yeah, and, uh, and and it seems like the journey there's no way back and I think that's where you know we always say that recovery is possible because I think you know people in addiction to, to the extreme sort of addictions to even the mild ones people often can see no way back uh, from where they find themselves in that hell um, and then you get all the guilt and the shame that you know yeah. you've done it to yourself people probably told you on the way there you didn't listen but now here you are uh, in this terrible place yeah I would say so and I think that the, the, what we see a lot with uh, chemsex is there's a lot of really high risk behaviours associated with sexual promiscuity there's a lot of mm. HIV transmission, hepatitis C and uh, this is quite prevalent in the chemsex scene and the shame associated with that with somebody that knows at the heart of themselves that they're doing something which puts them at real risk but is unable to maybe recognize yeah. that is really really there there's also a lot we see a lot of that said it can take within. it can take 10 20 years off of off of your life expectancy um, being in that environment yes. because of all of the uh, exposure to uh, a lot of unhealthy practices yeah. and, and depressions and suicides and diseases and well, the suicide really rates are very high. To, to, the suicide rates so are very much. high. Exactly, yeah. and I think there's there's practices within it which some people may or may not be surprised to, but there's there's purposeful transmission of HIV that goes on. So, you know, there's, there's ways of protecting yourself against this by taking something called PrEP, pre-exposure um, medications to support if you're going to be exposed to it. But there are, there are in, its, in maybe its darkest circles, there are, there's, there's purposeful transmission of HIV. People will say, you know, they want to become positive so they no longer have to worry about it because they know they can then go on to the medication afterwards to arrest it. There is 
sexualized injection of drugs, so slamming sorry, is that, a term that, used Sorry, could, it, you just, could we just question you on that bit? Because that seemed like, again, for somebody, I tried explaining that to Matt this morning, and I think, yeah. I think it's probably the first time he heard that, and he was shocked. So I'm just trying to think that people listening to this may never have heard anything quite like that before or that people would purposely I'm want really glad to you highlighted that contract yeah if you could, I'm really uh, glad you highlighted that because this that is the thing is us. often people will say they haven't heard anything like it before when people in the chemsex community try and explain what it's like and so this is why I really hammer home and, and, and say it's so important that we understand it as its own standalone experience so mm. I have come across clients that have purposefully contracted HIV with the motive that I'm in these environments, these chemsex environments, I no longer have to worry about getting it because now I've got it. And there is medication now that arrests it. So the risks of having it are less. So it's simpler for me to just have it because then I don't need to worry about using condoms and these kind of things. See, you know, when people are under the influence of drugs and alcohol, that inhibitions go down, especially with the use of things like G and crystal meth, there's much less safe sex going on. So the chance of contraction of hepatitis C, HIV, other sexually transmitted infections is much higher. So people, there is a very, there are, there are, there are situations where people will purposefully infect people, will say, look, yeah, I can infect you. If you'd like, I can I can do it. So, so, so just to get my head around it, it's not always necessarily like a malicious thing, like somebody's going out just to 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 spread that. But somebody will perp they will want to contract it. They will have logically thought this through, and oh, this is something that I want for yes. for, for these, so I can relax a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Strange so can, as that sounds. Well, it's, in some sense, doesn't it make sense? That if somebody is having sex yeah, with yeah. multiple sexual partners a week, knowing that the chances of them coming across it are really, really high, and they're constantly and anxious about whether they're going to get it, doesn't it make a bit of sense? It just, you know, if I have it, then I don't need to worry anymore. And while, in one sense, because to then us, they can ex. Please, just, carry on. sorry, just again, just to get my head around it again. So just because um, I'm coming this to, to this from quite a naive standpoint, but I think it helps for the people listening to have somebody like me here. Um, yeah. who doesn't really understand and um, so there are medications that you can take if you contract HIV if you know that you've got it you can you can keep med you can carry on a normal life and, and medicate yourself to sustain yes. your life for a longer period of time um, yes. but if you didn't know you had it then it would cause a, a deeper problem right so if you know you've yes. got it you can take preventative measures and that's that's where the relief comes from right Yes, and, and forgive me, I, I can't remember the exact name of the medication, but you know, within the last few years, there was a medication that, and I'll give a slap on the wrist from some of my colleagues for not knowing it, but there's a, there's a medication that's come out that essentially arrests it, that essentially arrests HIV. And, mm. and I really hope that what I'm saying is accurate because some listeners may will know more about this than I do, so I apologize if anything I'm saying is inaccurate. There's so much information out there in terms of it, sexual health clinics, talking to your GP, things like this right that you can get information and I'm not the best source of information to give guidance on this but it is, it is my understanding that I right, open to be to be corrected but there's medication out there there that really does support someone with HIV to have a prolonged relatively risk-free life okay there's medications there known as PEP and PrEP these stand for PEP post exposure prophylaxis and PREP, pre exposure prophylaxis. And these are medications that support someone if they are likely to come into contact with HIV positive people, so that's pre exposure, and if they know they have come into contact, PEP, post exposure. And these can actually reduce the chances of contracting the virus. Okay, so there's quite a lot of medications out there nowadays. It's not like it was in the 1980s when it was really, really you know life-threatening it still can be don't get me wrong it absolutely still can be and there are still really high numbers of people who are affected by this but in the chemsex community we see people not necessarily engaging with or seeing the risk as that bad because of these medications they can take and it's not common it's not common i want to stress this but i have come across people that have purposefully become infected so they don't have to worry about it anymore 
it, and so that's what's causing because I guess you're in that it's um, last time I was in London uh, uh, a drug and alcohol service they were concerned about the spread of HIV but um, prob mostly through the chemsex uh, activities uh, so I guess not some people it's just because they're just practicing unsafe sex but other people it is an intentional thing but that's a smaller minority obviously it's a very small minority but the, the risk is there because of the, the high likelihood of unsafe sex it, typically yeah. excuse me you know there will be people listening to this I hope that that, that you know are involved in chem sex and, and and do practice safe sex I've come across people that you know they, they've never had sex in a chem sex mm. environment without a condom the, the majority have a level of inhibition that comes from the use of these drugs and they, they choose not to use condoms you know other thing that happens is there's a lot of you know not completely consensual sex going on so somebody might be under the influence of G and will have multiple people have sex with them that they're not completely aware of at the time you know essentially rape and did you and say so sometimes they don't have control over unconscious yeah, and and so the, what I'm people, saying is, so is that people are not always aware. People are not always aware of the amount of sexual partners they may have had in one night because G is also nicknamed the date rape drug or one of the date rape drugs, and so this makes someone not particularly totally aware of what's going on. The measurements yes, of G to teach you a bit about the drug itself, they have to have extremely exact measurements. They take these in mils. In, in, in syringes of the measurements or, or pipettes it's extremely easy to overdose on these drugs and it's called going under in the chemist world and when people go under they can they can go into cardiac arrest they can they can die quite easily but also there's a level where they're not necessarily they're they're, they're they are not overdosed to the point where they're dying but they're essentially unable to do anything and, and, and rape happens in these circles sometimes. And so what I'm trying to stress is, is that people don't always know whether or not they've had safe sex or not. That's why the prep, I guess, is so important to use before or after. That's, that's the protection, if I guess. anyone comes to me, yeah, anyone comes to me and says that they're engaging in chem sex, Within the within the assessment, it's as you know. I really advise you to go and get on prep. How do you get on the on these preventative drugs? Is it, do you just go to the GP and you get a prescription? So sexual health clinics is typically how you do. So if you're in London, there's a place called Fifty Six Dean, Dean Street, and there's other sexual health clinics all over London. Fifty Six Dean Street is specialist in supporting those experiencing chem sex. And you go to the sexual health clinic and you, you say that you are having sex and, and coming across, likely to come across people with HIV positive statuses and that's how you get your prescription for, for PrEP. Or similarly, you go to a sexual health clinic or GP and say that you have, you have come into contact with someone that is HIV positive and, and you would get a prescription for PEP, for post-exposure. Okay. Cool. Thank you. I'd like to, you know, we say recovery is possible. That's the sort of motto. Uh, so I'd like to know a little bit more about the about the recovery side of it. You know, what does that look like? People obviously recover from it. You, you know, you, you've dabbled in, in that world and now you're where you are and you're helping other people. And that's obviously an inspirational story. And I wonder if you have any similar stories or any examples of, of people that have maybe been in the darker places and, and they've gone on to do to do better things i know you can't necessarily name any names but i, I don't know if there's any stories that, that you uh, might be able to share i can us. i can i can definitely show you and there is one there's one name that i have absolute certainty wouldn't mind being named um yes people do recover it's that simple it is possible it is definitely possible you know just like any any addiction with the right support with people that understand it, you can have incredible outcomes in terms of recovery. There's a lot of there's a lot of people out there in this world that have recovered 
that live free. So in terms of like where to go, if you are looking at getting support in terms of recovery stories, 12 step fellowships, there is something called Crystal Meth Anonymous. Crystal Meth Anonymous is a 12 step fellowship for people whose primary substance is crystal meth. And this fellowship really understands chemsex, really understands the realities of being in the world as a gay man or men that have sex with men, because it's not just gay men, there's heterosexual men in this world as well. And Crystal Meth Anonymous really understands what it's like. So if you're going to places like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and you don't feel that you really are getting the support environment that you need, CMA, Crystal Meth Anonymous, is out there. Okay, it's really quite loud and, 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 and about in London, as well as in other major cities around the world. There is organisations in London. There's one that's only a year old. I was up there, there when we first met last week, and I was really shattered. I was at their anniversary um, event in, in the night before. There's this organisation called Controlling Chemsex. Controlling Chemsex offer loads of support and help to everyone that is they that is first wanting to access help, you know, they have issues with the use of drugs, the use of chems and, and, and high risk chem sex behaviours, right through to psychosexual relationship counselling, to one to one support, peer support of somebody that is in recovery from chem sex addiction, that understands, that can go walk beside you from your with your with your experiences and what you're going through. Okay. So it really is possible to recover from this thing, right? While we really need to understand the realities and the risks and the nature of it, just as much, even with a louder voice, we need to say that actually there is life after chemsex. There is hope and there is happiness beyond how these people feel right now. What I would say that if you are engaging in, if you're listening to this, if anyone's listening to this, you know, one person, we, we often say this in terms of like the work we do, meetings, whatever it might be, if one person hears this and, and makes a decision to change, it's worth it. If you are, in, you, most of these people show up at sexual health clinics. That's one thing that's been found. In, and a, a colleague of mine, a trusted friend of mine actually, that, that uh, runs the LBGT um, section of the charity We Are With You, he recently went to a sexual health clinic to, to offer chemsex support and he was amazed. He couldn't believe the amount of people that were coming through the door. So this is where most people are showing up. It's in sexual health clinics, not in the drug and alcohol services. Partly because often people involved in chemsex will be much more confident in talking about their sexual promiscuity than talking about the reality that they use drugs at the same time. So this is where they're kind of showing up. So there is support in sexual health clinics if you say what you're doing. Not all of them, that's the challenge, is there isn't enough understanding about this thing out there. That's partly why we're doing this, have a chat about it. There is, There are therapists around, like myself, that, that understand it. There is a specialist treatment centre down on the south coast called Street Scene Allington House. They have a specialist chemsex addiction programme. And so there is stuff out there. The one thing I'd say is, Recovering from chemsex addiction is possible, but not possible alone. You know, you said, Lester, about you get to this point with addiction where you're very isolated, it stops really becoming about the reasons you were doing it in the first place, and you're in this cycle of use, right? And it's not possible really to recover completely on your own when you're in that place. The biggest predictor of any addiction recovery is to involve yourself with a community of people that have a shared experience and purpose, right? To involve yourself with people that are in recovery, that wish to get sober, okay? So that's really the most important thing, is to find people in your community that are living free from chemsex, that do see that there's a life after it. I hope that answers your question a little bit. Yeah, Sam, I've got a question. What would be... Uh, from your experience somebody's fears about seeking help or recovery or, or blocks what would be the you know like often people with heroin addiction they're really worried about the, the detox you know what would be the fears or blocks that would stop somebody um, trying to seek out these services and, and, and get some help so yeah, so detox may be one, definitely. Detoxing off G or crystal meth is a, is a tough game. It's not an easy thing, so detox, definitely. Fear of judgment, 
fear of judgment is definitely there. Often there's quite serious mental health conditions such as psychosis going on or, or suicide ideation, like the desire to harm yourself. So the fear of actually stopping and this getting worse. Okay, the fear of stopping and, and this kind of thing getting worse. People not understanding. So I've, I've met a few clients that have sought help in the past that have been to drug and alcohol services, that have been to rehab even, and they didn't feel held, understood, seen. And so this in itself is a block to getting help because many people may have tried to get help in the first place and unfortunately did not have the experience that we wish anybody reaching out for help with any kind of addiction has, where they are unconditionally held and seen. This isn't necessarily the fault of the people trying to support, it simply comes from a lack of understanding, a lack of really knowing what goes on with these kind of clients. And so the fact that they will not be understood, that they will not be believed, that they will not, that there is nowhere to go, this is definitely a bit of a block that I experience. Yeah, I think in all addictions, I think, you know, even myself sort of going into an AA meeting and saying, I'm an alcoholic, that identification in the beginning, um, I realise how important it is. I don't really, f like, keep calling myself that nowadays. I've not had a drink in 32 years, but, but I realise how important that was for me when I first... That, that identification is important so you even get like um, Alcoholics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous um, Narcotics Anonymous and all of the addictions are quite different in the way that it plays out in people's life experience and some are more extreme than others um, which kind of does cause a bit of division but then I've noticed the thing that often brings us back to, to get back together again is the recovery so uh, I do kind of endorse the different f sort of fellowships because I realise identification for people is incredibly important especially uh, I'm just sort of presuming in, in an area like that because of the guilt and the shame and um, that, that it's nice to know that other people understand and that they're not really judging you because they've done what you've done and that hearing them stories at the beginning that you know that was so important to me as a 25 year old man to realize that yeah. i wasn't a bad person that i just was not a very well person and instead of trying to be a bad person trying to get good i was a well person trying to get a sick person trying to get well so listening to them other people saying that they'd had the same experience as me that was a massive benefit to me so you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that I'm an alcoholic now because I realise that's important identification to to the new people. So I guess yeah. so I guess finding the right people, which again we can put some links up, um, and I think you've mentioned a few of them, that it really is important to Definitely. speak to 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 them people to, to get and, and then get involved in them groups to realise that, that you're not alone. That you're not alone. Definitely, and I think there's something else to sort of expand on that in the sense of what to do in terms of help being out there, is to understand that you're not alone and to understand that there, there are communities of people. You know, I can't stress controlling chemsex enough. They are based in London, right? But they have an enormous wealth of information online about, about what to do. What, everything from what to do when you're looking for help from what to do when somebody has overdosed on G, from what to do when you've been a victim of sexual assault. There's, I cannot stress, and the reason I said he probably wouldn't mind me saying this, the founder, he's very humble. I met him for the first time last week, but this man, Ignacio, is paving the way, really, in, in the last 12 months. There has been other people that have really made a big difference. A chap called David Stewart, who sadly passed at the beginning of this year, really started to make chemsex understood and seen and, and in terms of cultural competency, those of us looking to help, there's so much information on davidstewart.com on controlling chemsex. There's one thing I want to mention is there are three things that really showed positive outcomes in chemsex recovery, right? So you spoke about what help is out there. 
First is the need for people to feel safe and understood. Okay, for people to feel really safe in talking about their experience, for people to be really understood about the realities of their world. So those of us that are supporting anyone with an addiction, there's a, there's, it takes a day, really does take a day to really educate yourself on what chemsex is, on enough information so somebody can feel understood. Okay, The importance of shared experience and identification with others was there. You spoke about the importance of having your own identity and fellowships. Yeah, Somebody sitting in an AA meeting who is in psychosis and experiencing chemsex, they may really struggle to identify with people who only drink, right? Although we do see drugs so common now in AA. Mm. So it's really important to find people that have shared experience of what you go through and that you can identify with. Another thing that's really vital is we start to separate drugs and sex in chemsex recovery, right? So we have to start learning, talking about, exploring the concept of sober sex. I, I saw, probably should have spoken about this a lot more, but we have to start understanding and exploring the concept of sober sex. Sober sex and chem is, is a really triggering thing for people when they've used chems, when they've been involved with chems and sex for so long. It can be extremely triggering. A lot of clients I work with kind of talk about this new virginity, exploring sex for the first time. We found in our research that a period of sexual abstinence was indicative of positive outcomes. So a period of separation from sex, you know, six months to a year, three months, a period of sexual abstinence actually showed better outcomes in chemsex recovery. And that's really scary for people who have been getting a lot of their connection with others through the use of chems and sex. And the other thing is increasing what self-worth. People often involved in any kind of addiction, but I'm going to talk specifically about chem sex, they have such low self-esteem because of the kind of things they've experienced or engaged in themselves, you know, victims and perpetrators of sexual assault, because of their own back history of things they've been through. A lot of people in this community do have histories of abuse, of neglect, of judgment, of homophobia or internalized homophobia you know judging themselves there's a lot of sexual abuse history okay so people's self-worth and self-esteem is really impacted and a lot of chem sex in the beginning boosts someone's self-worth people often say when they took g for the first time they felt powerful they felt like themselves like nothing else mattered similar to other substances right and so actually separating the thing that people found their worth in, the use of chems and sex together, and then that became so detrimental, helping them to build self-worth and come to love themselves and come to get really excited about sober sex. One of the best things about the work I do is when somebody starts to engage in safe, sober sex and comes back and talks about it and the excitement of it and the what it's actually like. And, you know, sex should be nerve-wracking and exciting and explorative and and intimate you know real intimacy connection with someone without the barrier of chems this is so important in chem sex recovery and so learning how to engage in this is a really important part and it is possible it is possible to have sex without chems and it be a hundred times better that's something that's important to know when i started to when I myself started to have sex in my recovery, it was a really strange thing. And it took a while, but after a period of time, it was a hundred times better. And that's the thing. Yeah, that's that hard that done accept point starts. The abstinence, the abstinence allows that hard done accept point to start coming down again and, and resetting. And I think yeah. that's the gift of neuroplasticity that your mind can change. It's, you know, I always like that. If you, if you, you your brain way, your you, your brain creates pathways. But if you walk across grass, it creates a path, and then you tend to walk on that path. When you stop walking on that path and start going on a path that leads you somewhere more where you'd like to be, two things happen: is you start creating a new pathway, and the old pathway starts to cover over and stops being so strong. So. You know that period of abstinence um, can be a, 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 could could just help start that process. We'd call that in recovery the bridge um, to to normal living, which is that 
space between you know where you're at to where you want to be but crossing that bridge you may need a lot of support and a lot of help but if you keep going you'll you'll get to the other side of that bridge where it won't be such a chore to um, stay off that old path but it does take a bit of time yeah exactly it does it, it, it does it does take a bit of time and it takes a lot of courage and a lot of patience with yourself like it's gonna it's gonna be hard you're gonna have to you're gonna have to start to look at what life without the use of Kevin's is like you're gonna have to start to look at mm. what sex is like you know sometimes people in Asian chem sex are in are married and they do it secretly outside of their marriage and there's been a lot of infidelity so you have to start looking at becoming intimate with your husband or wife or whatever it might be right there's it's possible to recover from this stuff and it's the, the thing is is you know someone another therapist that works with this a lot called mike he he talks about it as a pandemic that chemsex is a pandemic moving across the, the world like new york san francisco london singapore sydney the, the the numbers there are so high and he really the, the reality is is people are dying just like other addictions and stuff, the suicide rates in chemsex are high. The overdose rates are high. It is fatal. That's the thing. It is fatal. And it's a lot of the times people are aware of that, but they ignore it because there is still something they get from it. It is possible to get everything that chems offers, everything and more in recovery, but the courage and the... Yeah. the the desire to change you know it's it it doesn't have to be huge just this pilot light this tiny little flickering pilot light that life can be different you don't have to be sat on sofas scrolling through grinder sitting on zoom rooms going through uh, bbrb which is a website where, where people connect you know you don't have to be in these environments you can find those of us that are living free and well hmm. I think there's that as well, that realisation when you are in recovery, is that it wasn't really what you were looking for anyway, that it was very synthetic, you know, not just the chemicals, but the behaviours. Um, and it can't, and again, it's not a solution, it's a temporary solution, because you end up on that couch at some point, it's just a matter of time, you're going to end up on that couch where you've not now you haven't got anything that you want and you probably ended up with everything you don't want but in recovery that journey is so much more fulfilling because it's 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 constantly evolving and developing like any good relationship it goes through all the changes but hopefully it gets um, deeper and, and, and sweeter and more fulfilling the longer that it goes on um, but you, you, you've got to be able to work through yeah. all of the ups and downs and difficulties. And I think, you know, I think the message you've already given, which I completely endorse, you're probably not going to be able to do that without great support. And you know, I always like, and I tell people, I say, look, imagine everything you want is in a treasure chest at the bottom of the sea. And and in life, you've got to get down to the treasure chest. But as you go down the pressure builds and as you get near the pressure becomes unbearable and so the way in life that we reach the treasure is we, we, we know that we need to build a container and and I always found the container is like my recovery buddies, sponsors, friends, family, that people that can be there that now I can be open and honest with them, they can help guide me through through the difficult stages because there is going to be them and there's no getting away from it that any version of recovery is a difficult experience but but again like um Definitely. trying to highlight i guess what you're saying that Let's, without the support through the stages you're just probably not going to make it you need that support exactly and like where to go looking for this support that's the thing that in the very early days where to go looking for yeah. it is it's great once we've got it it's really great once we've got it but where to find it is quite tricky so there's one thing i want to highlight which is quite a new thing is is there is a community of people on the apps you know set uh the grinder scruff these kind of apps 
where I have a profile myself for here in Bristol, for example, where we are there as part of the controlling chem sex movement to offer support and guidance. So I have chems support as my tag on this app, right? And the idea is if somebody is struggling, if they've had a night on chems, if they think that they will message me and I would offer an intervention online saying that this is the sort of thing you need to do if you've come in contact with HIV or if you have been a victim of sexual assault or if you've tried chems for the first time or if you're thinking about trying chems for the first time and this was the movement that Ignacio that founded Controlling Chemsex started is he just went on the apps and started offering interventions to people and so if anyone out there in London there's the most of these are in London right that's where the biggest London's known as the Chemsex capital of Europe so it's the biggest numbers really in Europe are going on in London if you're on Grinder, if you're on Hornet, if you're on any of these apps and you see anything, chems support, chems help, first aid, talk to them. Talk to them. Because they are there to help. They're there to help. And this is the thing is, it's out there if we look for it. Just like any kind of recovery help, it's out there if we look for it. And if you come across something where you feel disheartened, where you feel that someone doesn't understand, it's the hardest place to be in the world. It's the hardest place to be in the world. You know, I came across a story once of somebody who, in you know, in the, in the ends of their using, they were a victim of such in, in awful assault and kidnapping and trauma, like really awful things were going on. If you've heard of cuckooing, cuckooing, you know, there's people in their home using their home to sell drugs and keeping them yes. hostage. And places didn't believe them. They were going and saying, look, this is what's going on for me. And people didn't believe them. People didn't believe them. And eventually they sat down with their therapist and, and, and the, 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 the point in which they were able to get better is when their therapist put their hand on their knee and said, I believe you. I believe everything you're saying. Because the difficulty is, is when you feel disheartened, when you feel that someone doesn't get it, it's an incredibly difficult thing to keep going, to keep looking for help, but there are people out there that do get it. And just, Matt, you mentioned, you know, you said you're coming from this place of naivety. I disagree. You're just coming from a place of curiosity, of wanting to learn more. You know, it's this thing of chemsex does fly under the radar. It does. And so this is why I'm doing this. It's why people like controlling chemsex and Dean Street are around is to get it more spoken about. So my hope is that when at East Coast Recovery, you guys come into contact with this kind of thing, you just have a better idea of how to help these people mm. absolutely yeah and thank you so much Sam for getting on board and, and, and sharing this because yeah you know, you know I, I think I come from a place of just sort of regular people outside of the addiction circles for the most part uh, and yes and outside of, of, of the gay community and really any kind of you know part I, I, I have a few beers down the pub and that's about the extent of my drug use so it's um, yeah having conversations with you like this I think is going to open up a lot of, a lot of people's uh, ears to the situation so I really appreciate you coming on Sam just before you, we, we wrap up just one more thing just um, thinking about the families of you know if they know it's like say it could be somebody's other half could be their brother could be a friend that they that there's mm. there's one and if you could maybe say if they notice, you know, that the people are getting depressed or whatever symptoms it, that you find are common that people could look for and possibly where they could also go if they've got concerns about a loved one or family member that they could gain some more information or know where to, um, to, yeah. to signpost people because they're often quite desperate um, when I've spoke to family members that they just don't know sort of what to do and that they're watching you know the person that they love going to this decline definitely I think those of us that have worked in addiction you know I've, I've, I'm really transparent I've not been in addiction super long only since 2017 um, in, in the, the training and the work but those of us that have been in it for any period of time have come across families and it, and it, it, it does impact the family and if you have someone that's going through any kind of addiction it's terrifying and and if somebody says chemsex and you have some idea of what that is and you understand about the promiscuity and the high risk behaviors it, it is really really scary place to be so in terms of what support is out there you can support the individual 
by listening. I know that sounds like a strange thing, but by actually hearing what they're going through. A lot of families, they will want to immediately offer solutions, want to fix. They turn into, I call it crisis mode. When I have a mum or a dad or a husband or a wife come to me, they're in crisis mode, right? They're in crisis mode. We need to get this person into treatment. We need to get them to see you as an addiction therapist. And really, the first thing I do with them is I say, let's take a step back for a moment. Let's take a step back for a moment. And if we can create a space where we can actually listen to what the person is going through, rather than immediately try and fix and rescue, which is incredibly difficult, by the way. That desire to rescue, to help, is so overwhelming. But what it can do is it can push the person away. Especially if we start to try and take control of the situation. If we can create a space where they can come to us you know then that actually makes an enormous difference what support is out there there are you know we've mentioned 12-step fellowships today there are 12-step fellowships for people family members there's families anonymous which tends to be for family members of drug addiction they're, they're more prevalent online in the uk i believe there's Al Anon, which is for support of people with alcohol. Although what I'm seeing more in Al Anon and in the families, I work with family members of people in addiction as well. So they're going to Al Anon saying, My son uses heroin and they're being accepted, they're being welcomed. Okay, so that's somewhere to go. There is, so online on Controlling Chemsex website, there is support. I mean, I've, I've hammered home Controlling Chemsex today, but actually, one of the reasons is it's really the only service that's out there in the UK so that's one of the reasons I've said them so much because they're the only one that's out there in the UK and I'm going to be talking to them soon about how maybe we can start to do something in Bristol to try and expand so it, it, it's it's really it's really number one as to what's out there find someone to talk to yourself about it so I I say to family members often the reality when somebody is using drugs when somebody is engaged in an addiction one of the hardest things in the world is to realize that there is nothing we can do. Not to say that we don't have this desire to help, have this desire to support, but we have to be beside them and give them the opportunity to ask for help rather than run in and force the help upon them. So get support for yourself, whether it's seeing a counselor in your local area, whether it's joining a support group, mutual aid group around help for families, whether it's finding something online in terms of controlling chemsex in terms of family group therapy for those in addictions and I, I'm just kind of I don't know of a family group therapy for those in addictions right so maybe that's something to start actually it's not a bad idea yeah. this idea that there is help for you too because if you can better help yourself and understand how it's impacting you you can better help the person you can better help the person in terms of what to do if somebody comes to you and says mum dad you know husband wife i'm engaging in chemsex letting them know that it's okay that you're beside them and and are willing to help is really important if we respond and react in fear it often ignites fear in the other person and makes helping more difficult and it's really difficult but if we can if we can be with them and beside them it makes all the difference and the other difficulty is aren't I going to be really over I'm finding answering this question slightly difficult because the lack of support that is out there for families in this area right the lack of availability that's out there there needs to be more there needs to be more so I think that's in all addiction I think unfortunately yeah it is and so that's the thing is considering Sorry. No, please. That's right. Sorry, I'll, I'll just say it's a, it's a show. There used to be a program. Um, uh, go on, Sam. I think we've got a bit of a delay there. Well, so there used to be a program. There used to be a program called Moving Parents and Children Closer Together for, for when there's addiction in the family. And I, I don't know exactly how that's moving now. It was part of the action on addiction who merged with Forward Trust in, in the pandemic. What I would say is if you are really looking for support and help, reach out to rehabs in your area. This is what I would propose, right? I'm thinking on my feet right now. Reach out to rehabs in your area. Ask them what they might suggest. You know, I'm a family member of someone with a drug addiction 
and I need support and see what they have, what support they have available, what they would suggest, where they would signpost. And actually, it is, you're right, Lester, there is a lack of support for families of those in addiction in the UK. There is actually, I'm thinking, there is a programme called the Respire programme. We'll put this in the available support out there. The Respire programme is a programme for working with family members of those in addiction. And I just remembered them off some of my things. There, is, there are things out there. Yeah, we'll make so we're going sure to have quite that... a few different resources We'll make sure that in rehabsuk.com that we put together an information uh, email that we can send to people as well if, they, if they're struggling or on our websites. Go ahead, Matt. So I just wanted to say we've gone over, or Sam, you've in particular, you've gone over quite a few different resources today uh, and I will be putting everything into some show notes. So if this, wherever this goes, we upload to Anchor and Spotify and, and, and uh, you know Apple Podcasts, there will be links to these services within there. And if you're watching this on Facebook or Twitter or any of those segments as well, we'll, we'll be putting uh, I'll be putting links in the comments as well. Um, so yeah, don't don't worry if you feel like you've missed something in the podcast. I'll make sure that well, this is for the listeners, of course. I'll make sure that there are links to all of these services. Uh, and of course, as as you said, Lester, you can always reach out to to rehabsuk.com or eastcoastrecovery.co.uk, uh, and our treatment advisors will be up to date, having listened to this, and, and they'll know the places to to guide you as well. So we've had a really fantastic chat today and I really appreciate your time, Sam. I wonder, I, th I feel like it's coming to a, a natural end and we've been going for a good amount of time, but is there anything you wanted to say, any, any closing closing comments? Maybe there's there's some, some up and coming event or, or anything like that that you might want to pull people's attention towards? So really I've covered a lot in the chat. Um, in terms of up and coming event, there's nothing that I know about right now, actually. But one thing I'd say is that for anyone out there that is listening, that is involved in chemsex. There is life after it. It's not permanent. It's not permanent. If you experience any kind of, you know, psychotic symptoms, delusions, voices, believe things that aren't there, this is as a result of the chems. You know, if you're suicidal, this is as a result of what you're experiencing. And there is hope. There really is hope. Okay. Um, like Matt said, we'll put together what is available out there to support and help and 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 reach out reach out and for anyone out there that is working in addictions listening to this that comes across it there is so much information by a simple google search that can upskill you and educate you just so that when someone comes and says i'm involved in chemsex they can have that key ingredient of really feeling understood which is the most important thing of any kind of therapeutic work right of really understanding the perspective of someone so and if anyone ever wants to learn any more to have a conversation with me about it send me an email i'm very happy to badge on about it forever and ever so we can have a chat about it to any <laughs> practitioners rehabs that listen to this i love talking about it uh so yeah feel free to reach out awesome i really appreciate that sam well <laughs> Thank you very much for tuning into the Old Attitudes podcast. Thank you, Sam, for joining us. Thank you, Lester. Hope everybody has a yeah. fantastic day, and please do reach out if you need to. Yeah.